My name is Michael Grandy. I'm a certified public accountant and uh, professor at Providence College. This semester, I'm teaching uh, an MBA class in the graduate school, which is essentially the graduate version of managerial accounting. Um, today's lecture is going to be a, a PowerPoint presentation on responsibility accounting. And we're using the Garrison, Noreen, and Brewer textbook, the 17th edition and focusing specifically on chapter 11. And responsibility accounting essentially is finding ways and formulas to measure the performance of managers, managers at various levels within the organization. It could be uh, someone who simply is overseeing uh, a cost department, maybe a manufacturing cost department, or maybe someone who oversees a, a branch where they control revenues and expenses, but it could also be someone who is um, managing a large plant with many employees. And this, this manager has control over revenues, expenses, and the investment of funds. So let's take a look at this. I'm gonna share my screen with you and we will, um, bring up this PowerPoint presentation. And we want to start this from the beginning. And I want to be sure I share the screens here, duplicate the screens. So we see both of these things. Okay. So responsibility accounting chapter 11. So what are decentralized organizations? Well, decentralized organization is a large company that has many locations. Maybe they have a division in Boston, a division in Providence, a division in New Haven, division in Chicago. So they have many, many locations. And these decentralized organizations have some autonomy. And there are again, managers at various levels. And the question is what level of responsibility, what level of decision-making do these managers have? So there are obviously benefits and there are, there are drawbacks. So what are some of the benefits? Well, lower level decisions often based on better information. It means the managers on site in that particular location know what's going on and, and they can make better decisions because they have better information. Obviously the person in Providence who oversees the Providence office can make better decisions for Providence rather than someone who may be in Chicago. Lower level managers gain experience in decision-making. Obviously, to the extent you're making small decisions and making them well, later on during your tenure in an organization, you're able to take on bigger projects and make bigger decisions. Top management has the ability to be freed up to concentrate on bigger issues, on strategy. Lower level managers can respond more quickly to customers. If there's a customer complaint in Providence, the manager in Providence can handle that situation as opposed to sending it to Chicago for, a, for an answer. But there are also disadvantages. There may be a lack of coordination among autonomous managers. Lower level managers' objectives may be different than those of the organization. And lower level managers may make decisions without seeing the big picture on the overall organization. Responsibility accounting. This is where managers are held responsible for those items and only those items that the manager can actually control a responsibility center is used for any part of an organization whose manager has control over and is accountable for cost, profit, or investments. So what is a cost center? Well, cost centers are lowest level of the organization. It's a segment whose manager has control over only the costs, not revenues and not operational assets. Next level is a profit center a segment whose manager has control over both costs and revenues, but not over operational assets. And lastly, an investment center, and that's the one we're gonna be talking about, is a segment whose manager has control over costs, revenue, 
and investment in operating assets. Well, the last part of this, what is an investment in an operating asset? Well, it could be something as simple as buying a new truck or a machine, maybe a new building, maybe starting up a new uh, product line, or maybe buying a small business that could be enveloped into the current business. So the first objective we're gonna have here is we wanna be able to learn how to compute return on investment ROI and show how changes in sales, expenses, and assets affect return on investment. Here's our basic formula for calculating return on investment, which is net operating income divided by average operating assets. Now, it seems like a very simple formula, but what goes into these items? So what specifically is net operating income? Well, let me start off by saying net operating income is not equal to net income. Net income is the bottom line on the income statement, but net operating income is simply income before interest expense and before income tax expense. What are average operating assets? So let's focus on operating assets obviously not total assets. Operating assets are those which generate operational income and are used in the operations of the business. Cash, accounts receivable, inventory, property, plant, and equipment, and other productive assets. It does not include short-term investments, long-term investments, loans to other companies, and it does not include land held for investment purposes or speculative purposes. It does, however, include land on which our building or our facility sits on because it's therefore operational. But land that is simply bought because you think you can have a profit later on is not an operational asset. Well, what about average? Well, average means that we're gonna take the balances in these assets at the beginning of the year, add it to the assets at the end of the year and divide it by two, hence come up with an average. In addition, most companies use the net book value of depreciable assets to calculate average operating assets. So you'd have the original cost less the accumulated depreciation, you use the net book value. So let's look a little more closely at return on investments. And we define the formula as net operating income divided by average operating assets. But we also want to define margin. And margin is net operating income divided by sales. Turnover is sales divided by average operating assets. So when you look at the formula for margin and the formula for turnover, you can see return on investment essentially equals margin times turnover. Because why? Because sales algebraically cancels out. Here's an example. Regal Company reports the following. Net operating income, $30,000. Average operating assets, $200,000, sales, $500,000, operating expense, four seventy. dollars What is Regal Company's return on investment? So you can calculate margin and turnover separately, okay? But we can also simply take net operating income, which is what? $500,000 in sales, minus $470,000 in operating expenses, $30,000 net operating income, divided by average operating assets of $200,000. So you get 15%, right? The sales cancel out. So you can use the formula margin times turnover or more simply net operating income of $30,000 divided by Average operating assets of 200,000 come up with 15%. Here's another example. Assume that Regal's manager invests 
in a $30,000 piece of equipment that increases sales by $35,000 while increasing operating expenses by $15,000. So some of our numbers have changed, right? Our sales have gone up, our operating expenses have gone up, and our average operating assets have gone up. So here's our formula. Again, the sales cancel out. So the return on investment has increased. It's gone from 15% to 21.8%. So the investment of that asset made sense. It improved return on investment. But there are some criticisms of return on investment. In the absence of a balanced scorecard, management may not know how to increase return on investment. Managers often inherit many committed costs over which they have no control. And managers evaluated on return on investment may reject profitable investment opportunities, which we're going to see. Second method by which managers are evaluated is the residual income. And we want to understand its strengths and its weaknesses. Residual income is net operating income above some minimum return on operating assets. Hence, it's what's left over or the excess over which was expected of somebody. So here's the formula for calculating residual income. It's the actual net operating income minus your average operating assets multiplied by a percentage, multiplied by the minimum required rate of return. Look at the minimum required rate of return as what is expected as a return on those assets. This computation differs from return on investment because return on investment measures net operating income earned relative to the investment in average operating assets, whereas residual income measures net operating income earned less the minimum required return on average operating assets. Here's an example. The retail division of Zephyr Inc. has average operating assets of $100,000 and is required to earn a return of 20% on these assets. So they should have earned, or they were expected to earn what? $20,000. In the current period, the division earns $30,000. So they actually earn 30, they were expected to earn 20, isn't residual income $10,000? And that's what it is, right? So it's not very difficult. Residual income encourages managers to make profitable investments that would be rejected by managers using return on investment. So what I'd like to say here is that managers make decisions based upon how they're evaluated. If they're evaluated using return on investment, they always want to show improvement of return on investment, improvement over the prior year's return on investment, because managers that show improvement, ma managers that outperform other managers will receive additional compensation, bonuses, promotions. Redmond Awnings, a division of Wrap Up Corp, has net operating income of $60,000 and average operating assets of $300,000. The required rate of return for the company is 15%. What is the division's return on investment? It's going to be net operating income of $60,000 divided by $300,000 of operating assets. It's going to be 20%. Next question. Redmond Awnings, a division of wrap up, has a net operating income of 60 and average operating assets of 300,000. If the manager of the division is evaluated based on return on investment, will she want to make an investment of $100,000 that would generate additional net operating income of $18,000 per year? Let's think about it. The manager is going to make decisions make investment decisions that improve return on investment. So this manager is only going to make investments that 
increase return on investment. So if they look at an investment and it does not equal to where they currently are or improve them, they are going to reject it. Let's look at this investment opportunity. This investment opportunity is gonna generate $18,000 of net operating income on an investment of $100,000. That's a return on investment of 18%. But this manager is currently at 20%. Incorporating this new investment brings down their return on investment. So this manager is going to reject it. Because once you incorporate it, it brings it down to 19.5%. The company's return required, the company's required rate of return is 15%. Would the company want the manager of Redmond Awnings Division to make an investment of $100,000 that would generate additional net operating income of $18,000 per year? So this is, this is the company versus the manager. So the company's required rate of return is only 15%, but this investment generates 18%. So on an overall company perspective, it would bring up, it's an excess of their required rate of return. So the answer is gonna be yes. Let's look at another example. Again, the same situation, Redmond Awnings, a division of wrap up, has net operating income of 60 and average operating assets of 300. The required rate of return for the company is 15%. What is the division's residual income. So let's think about this for a minute. Their actual net operating income is 60,000. The required rate of return is 15% on $300,000. That's $45,000. Actual net operating income, 60,000. Required return on investments, $45,000. Isn't the residual income $15,000? Another one, if the manager of Redmond Awnings Division is evaluated based on residual income, will she want to make an investment of $100,000 that would generate an additional net operating income of $18,000? Absolutely, because you're gonna add residual income. You're gonna show additional residual income of what? Of $3,000. The required minimum is 15% on that investment of $100,000, that's $15,000. They actually show net operating income of $18,000. They're gonna increase residual income by $3,000. The answer is of course gonna be yes. And that's essentially where I wanna end. I don't wanna cover the following learning objectives. So we'll stop sharing here. And we'll